Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam, for this uh, lovely invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. My name is Kostas Tasunopoulos. I'm Associate Curator of Life Orgasm at the Serpentine in London. And I'm here to talk to you today about our um, long-term project called Back to Earth, um, a project dedicated to the environment and the climate emergency. And um, through that, I will give you an overview of what we're trying to do and also focus on a couple of uh, specific um, projects that we're working within the wider context of Back to Earth. Um, so on the occasion of the Serpentine's 50th uh, anniversary and over the course of 2020 and beyond, 2020 were uh, the 50 years of the Serpentine, more than 65 leading artists, architects, uh, poets, filmmakers, scientists, thinkers and designers are invited to contribute to Back to Earth, a new multi-year project. Back to Earth invites practitioners to respond to the climate emergency strategically and with a collaboration of partner organizations by proposing artworks that are also a campaign or a methodology or an intervention. Interdisciplinary at its very core, Back to Earth manifests throughout all of the Serpentine's programs on site, off site and online, sharing its resources to amplify ongoing projects or campaigns or develop new ones. Back to Earth thinks about ecology as it weaves in and out of those practices and agencies embedded in the everyday. Rather than celebrating escape strategies from Earth reserved for the few, it roots itself firmly in the messy and complex realities of the ground on which we walk. Back to Earth is uh, both a program about change and a catalyst for change. Um, much like the climate crisis itself, Back to Earth is a complex web of interconnected research, interventions, and activities. It asks, what new ecosystems can foster agency within ecosystems? What kinds of research sharing, resource sharing, and collaborative working practices are necessary to present complex responses to complex problems? In the current environmental emergency, Back to Earth advocates for the implementation of small, incremental, and transformative shifts, both within the serpentine itself and outside of it, to, oper to operationalize the activities of an art institution towards the effort uh, of uh, environmental change and responding to the climate emergency. <clears throat> uh, just give me one second. So for 50 years, the Serpentine's program has amplified the voices of artists addressing urgent issues such as social injustice and the ecological threat to our planet. Especially in 2020, that was our anniversary and a 50 year birthday. We not only face the onset of the worst pandemic of our life, but the worst, but we are also confronted with a global call for racial justice and inequality, which is intrinsically linked to the health of our planet. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the current environmental emergency, Back to Earth advocates um, for bringing together a large network of partners and artists and other practitioners whose work responds to the current climate and looking ahead at what, is, at what we're about to face. And within that, we make as an art institution a long-term commitment to bring those people together, bring people together that you know usually you wouldn't think of bringing people together, such as an artist and a scientist, a designer and a climate activist to work together on something that makes sense for their own timelines. So we wanted to invite people and really respond to what it is that they're working in uh, within the climate emergency and respect those timelines because that's the way we feel as an art institution, we can support um, practices that will bring about meaningful change. Back to Earth weaves itself in and out of all of the Serpentine's activities in 2020 and beyond. These include a major group exhibition that opens this summer in 2022 at the Serpentine, live programs and performances, education and projects, digital commissions, cinema and film programs, publications and research, infrastructure, organization and governance. In this context, we believe that art has a critical job of making public understanding of science more of an aesthetic embodied experience and can act as a powerful tool of visualization and helping us to imagine new possible futures. 
All of the methodologies and practices of Back to Earth were open sourced as a toolkit via a series of podcasts released throughout 2020 and 2021 that narrated and discussed the progress and findings of each of the initiatives. Throughout the project, we will be tracking how each initiative, as well as the programming and organizational structure that subtends them, can become a prototype that can be translated or applied through other organizations. So the podcast um, that I'm showing here, you can find in Apple Podcasts and Google Play and via the Serpentine website, and it's the best source of information about all of our thinking so far and uh, featuring many, many voices that, um, and many different uh, topics within the Back to Earth project if you want to dive into um, Back to Earth a little bit more. In summer 2022, a porous exhibition will present responses to Back to Earth with many of the works shown in the gallery acting as markers of campaigns and interventions that reach far beyond the building's walls. The Serpentine will continue to work with artists embedded in schools, local government, and social care services, exploring the intersection of climate justice with labor, immigration, and an unequal distribution of resources. By the Serpentine's digital program, it will challenge and reshape the role that technology can play in our culture and society to chart a course that tells an alternative story of the role of technologies in our collective future on Earth and beyond. Rather than scalability, the project looks at multipliability. Believing that there is no such thing as a single solution to a problem as complex and as multifaceted as the climate crisis, Back to Earth echoes this multiplicity. It seeks to foster polyvocal responses, a diversity of positions and experiences, and the urgency of collaboration across disciplines. Back to Earth emerges out of the Serpentine's long-standing engagement with the topics of extinction and the disappearance of species, knowledges and customs, which began with the 2014 Extinction Marathon co-curated with artist Gustav Metzger, as well as out of general ecology, the Serpentine's multi-year project taking place across public programs, publications, exhibition and radio with the aim of embedding environmental and ecological concerns across the Serpentine's programs, infrastructure and networks. As all of the project's strands will manifest themselves at different paces, Back to Earth is an anniversary like no others. Rather than celebrate the last 50 years of the Serpentine, it calls forth artists, partners, and friends to look ahead and imagine together for the next 50, 500, or 5,000 years. Um, I'm going to give you a very um, visual um, access into what Back to Earth is. These are my notes in order to make the sense, in order to make sense of what we have done so far and where we are going. So uh, here's a sneak preview. Uh, this is a visual map of everything we've done so far. Um, as I said, it features public programs, digital commissions, uh, film commissions, publications, uh, public engagement projects, um, education projects, and uh, technology. <clears throat> this is uh, in the middle, it should have said back to earth so far. I don't know why it disappeared, but this, are, this is the way all of the projects are connected to each other. So from a publication, you go to a podcast, from a podcast, you go to the Sun Commission, the campaigns is uh, the different projects proposed by different artists. Um, and then, yeah, there we go back to it so far. Um, and then this is a sneak preview of the Back to Earth Live program that I'm responsible for and I'm looking after, which is going to appear, begin to appear for, um, in this summer and go into autumn and winter. So um, you will see that Sun and Sea, the opera performance that won the Golden Lion in the Venice Biennale of 2019, curated by my colleague and friend Lucia Pietrajusti, is coming. To London in June, it's going to be presented as part of Back to Earth Live in collaboration with uh, the London International Theatre Festival and the Albany and um, the Municipality of Lewisham uh, from June to July. So keep an eye for that one. Uh, tickets are going to be announced soon. Then Back to Earth 2022, as I said, will feature the exhibition, um, a new podcast series, the publication that I'm going to speak speak about in the end, Sun and Sea. Sun and Sea will also be accompanied by a live program that addresses environmental justice. 
um, that we will have a program that I'm working on focusing on core ecologies, a live program with Brian Eno, a film premiere by Monte Diawara, performances by Himale Sengsoin and Bonston Jones, and um, uh, a live program accompanying the Polymeter Pathmaker by Daisy Kinsberg that I will focus on a little bit later. So now I'm gonna give you um, an insight look into three of the Back to Earth projects. I know that you have a special interest in biology and this um, festival and marathon of talks and lectures. So I'm gonna focus on uh, Back to Earth projects that um, really at the core speak about uh, interspecies relationships. Tomas Araceno is an artist that lives and works in and beyond planet Earth, as he says. His floating sculptures, artworks, and interactive installations challenge ways of inhabiting and sensing the environment. Calling for environmental justices that enable interspecies cohabitation, Saraceno's artistic collaboration seeks a relationship with the terrestrial, atmospheric, and cosmic realms, particularly through his community projects, Aerosene and Arachnophilia. Arachnophilia is an interdisciplinary research-driven initiative by Tomas Araceno that emerged from more than 10 years of collaboration with humans, spiders, and their webs. Through this community, Arachnophilia creates links across multiple artistic, scientific, and theoretical disciplines, including vibrational communication, biomateriomics, architecture and engineering, animal ethology, non-human philosophy, anthropology, biodiversity conservation, sound studies, and music. Since 2019, Arachnophilia has proposed new pathways for cultivating effective relations between spiders and humans, some technological and some speculative, harnessing digital tools to cultivate multi-species kinship in the technosphere and the biosphere. Last summer, as part of Back to Earth, Tomas Saraceno encouraged us to move away from a fear of spiders, arachnophobia, and towards a love of spiders, arachnophilia, which is the artist of the artist's long running research project. By augmented reality AR, versions of two spiders, the Maratus speciosus, also called the peacock spider because of its colored markings that you see here, and by Gira Kiplingi, the world's only vegetarian spider, Saraceno aims to raise awareness and funds for the protection of biodiversity in the age of global warming. Two giant AR spiders were positioned outside Serpentine Gallery throughout summer 2021. One of them we can, you can see here. While a small version of the Marato Speciosus can still be viewed through your phone, wherever you are in the world, by, dialogue, by dialogue, downloading the Acute AR app, who was our partner in this project, in exchange for a photograph of a real spider or web you will go finding around you. By asking participants to look for spiders and webs in order to be able to access, to access the small AR spider by Kira Kiplinki, Saraceno draws attention to the location and habitats on which spiders rely in our daily lives, inside buildings, behind doors, on windows, under leaves. He asks us to reconsider our relationship to spiders. How can we protect them and savor their habitats? The submitted images via the images that the public sends through the app become a part of the Arachnomancy app built by Saraceno that connects observations of spiders and their webs around the world. So it's an ongoing public archive. Webs of Life invites a deeper consideration of our non-human neighbors and encourages everyone to play a role in the environmental justice. It is an experiment informed by the idea of technodiversity discussed by writer and philosopher Yuk Hui, in which a relatively new technology is used in the service of biodiversity, moving us towards a truly augmented reality. The other case that I want to talk to you about is uh, a project called Climavore by Cooking Sections. Cooking Sections are artists and sp spatial practitioners that examine the systems that organize the world through food. Using site responsive installation, performance, and video, they explore the overlapping boundaries between art, architecture, ecology, and geopolitics. Established in London in 2013 by Daniel Fernandez Pascual and Anol Suabe, their practice uses food as a lens and tool to observe landscapes in transformation. As part of Back to Earth, 
Space with practitioners cooking sections are continuing their ongoing research project Climavore. Working with scientists, chefs, farmers, policy makers, and practitioners from several other disciplines, Climavore proposes an adaptive, regenerative form of eating, a shift in the economy and ecology of how we consume, interact with, and produce food towards environmental well being in the climate emergency. Restaurants and museums across the UK are becoming climate-born, removing farmed salmon from their menus and replacing it with ingredients that improve water quality and cultivate marine habitats like seaweeds, sea vegetables, and bivalves. The restaurant at the Serpentine has introduced a climate menu, which includes seaweed soda bread, rope-grown mussels, and an agar panna cotta. Following the launch of the climate menu at the magazine restaurant at Serpentine by Benugo, a further 21 UK museum restaurants joined to eliminate farmed salmon and introduce new dishes made with eco-friendly coastal ingredients. Different from the now obsolete Eurocentric cycle of spring, summer, autumn and winter, Climavor rethinks the construction of space and infrastructure by focusing on how climate alterations offer a new set of clues to adapt our diet to them. Climavore is then produced as a form of devour, devouring following their effects on anthropogenic landscapes. Unlike carnivore, omnivore, locavore, vegetarian, or vegan, Climavore is not only about the origin of the ingredients, but also about the agency that those ingredients have in providing spatial and infrastructural responses to man-induced climatic events for a certain period of time. Framing our diet within a globally financialized landscape and challenging large-scale agribusiness groups dictating what it is to be produced and consumed, the notion of climavore critically questions the geopolitical implications behind the making of climate alterations and the pressures they enforce on humans and non-humans alike. By becoming climavore, Cultural institutions worldwide can be at the forefront of a collective effort to reimagine existing food justice models and create new ones in the face of a climate emergency. This is a really good example of how you can bring together artists and creative practitioners with um, other partners such as Benugo, who is uh, the company that operates our restaurant and many restaurants across UK museum institutions to create a project together and actually affect change. The, the changes that have been implemented in our restaurant have what the project is about is a um, regenerative and thrivable way of eating rather than, you know, offering um, quick fix solutions when people don't have enough information uh, on how they can best contribute personally and collectively to the climate emergency. This is an example of uh, an artist project and an institution like the Serpentine working together and affecting that change that is necessary in the effort um, against the climate breakdown. And it is also a way to imagine that if this can happen at, a, at the scale that it, that it has within the Serpentine with these artists, then these artists are in contact with Benugo. Benugo is a big representative and, comp and um, amazing company within the restaurant business. So you go from artist to institution to restaurant, and then hopefully you will also uh, be addressing change and affecting changes within people who are not in the art world, they will hear about this and the restaurant and um, uh, food industry will hopefully uh, take lessons and come on board. The other project that I wanted to talk to you about was is Pollinator Pathmaker by Daisy Ginsburg. Alexander Daisy Ginsburg is an artist examining our fraught relationships with nature and technology. Through artworks, writing, and curatorial projects, Daisy's work explores subjects as diverse as artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, conservation, biodiversity, and evolution, as she investigates the human impulse to better the world. Daisy has spent over 10 years experimentally engaging with the field of synthetic biology, developing new roles for artists and designers. 
Pollinator Path Maker is a living sculpture made of plants. Unlike most gardens, however, this one is designed to feed and house pollinators rather than as a pleasing view for humans. Daisy Ginsberg has worked with pollinator experts and horticulturalists to create a long list of plants that are suitable for each location and that benefit pollinators. Once the conditions of the site of the garden are agreed, a custom-built computer algorithm designs the planting based on a grid of pixels. The patterns that emerge offer pollinators, including bees, moths, ants, wasps, and beetles, a variety of heights, food sources, habitats, and pathways. A new addition of Pollinator Pathmaker is, the, is Daisy Kinsberg's contribution to Back to Earth, and it will be planted in Hyde Park in Kensington Gardens together with the Royal Parks. Bees, hoverflies, butterflies, moths, wasps, beetles, and other pollinators are essential for many plant species to reproduce and for ecosystems to flourish. But human-made habitat loss, pesticides, invasive species, and climate change are causing a terrifying decline in pollinator populations around the world. Without pollinators, many plants cannot reproduce and make seeds. Without seeds, many of the trees, flowers, and crops we rely on simply will not exist. Plants are vital to the survival of life on Earth, including us. How and what we plant matters, so Ginsberg asked, what would a garden look like if it were designed from a pollinator's perspective rather than ours? Pollinators see colors differently from us, forage in different ways, and emerge in different seasons to each other. As a result, a garden designed for them may look quite different from a garden that is designed for us. The first pollinator path maker edition garden, a 55 square meter permanent installation is now open at the Eden project in Cornwall, which is what you see here. At Eden, the pollinator path maker algorithm chose and then arranged 64 plant species from the plant palette to support the greatest diversity of pollinators. The planting include perennials such as the towering Echium pininana, loved by moths, solitary bees, bumblebees, honeybees, and butterflies. The Cornish Heath Erica Vagans, which attracts bumblebees, flies, hoverflies, butterflies, and moths. And Aquilegia vulgaris, a favorite for short and long tongued bumblebees. Pollinator Pathmaker is not just about large public gardens. At pollinator.art, you can use the algorithmic tool for free to make your own garden artwork. Simply follow the steps in the algorithmic toolbox to select your garden conditions and play with how the algorithm solves the problem of empathy. It then generates a garden design for you, and each design is created as a one-off edition of the artwork. The last thing I wanted to touch upon is this first publication of Back to Earth, um, a collaboration with Penguin called 140 Artist Ideas for Planet Earth. Um, and through drawings, thought experiments, recipes, instructions, gardening ideas, insurgences, and personal revolutions, 140 artists come together for a publication dedicated to the environment and the climate emergency. Out of Back to Earth and our great collaboration and ongoing dialogue with Penguin, um, grew a desire to publish a book dedicated to the environment and the climate emergency. We invited 140 contributors during a time when we were seriously restricting our capacity to, get to, to gather together, to serve thoughts on the environmental effort, and to work together on a collection of ideas about how to save a more ecological and equitable future. During this time of social distancing and effect of the ongoing pandemic and ensuing global crisis, we have been thinking a lot about how and why we congregate, share ideas, and care for life on this planet. We asked our contributors to share a short piece of text, an image, or a drawing that they felt could represent an instruction, a DIY action, a recipe, a score, or an offering for the earth. At the core of this project is the work of the visionary Martinican poet, philosopher, and literary critic, Edouard Glissant, who developed important ideas about creolization, the archipelago, and mondialité, and the pioneering artist Gustav Metzger, whose dedication to the environment and his advice to remember nature is always with us. Glissant argued that we currently uh, are contending both with the homogenizing, homogenizing forces of globalization and with a counter-reaction, 
in which there are dangerous new forms of neo-localism and neo-nationalism and a lack of solidarity. And he believed we have to resist both forces. We have to resist the homogenized globalization that will lead to extinction, to an environmental disaster and to the disappearances of language and species. We have to resist the counter reaction that shuts down dialogue, that provokes localism and fracture. And Glissant insisted that we need to come up with a new kind of practice, mondialité, a form of worldwide exchange that recognizes and preserves diversity in realization, the cultural complexity of the world in which we live and the many diverse societies that exist within it. And we must develop projects to this end to bring worlds into contact with other worlds, to multiply the number of worlds. And this is the result, a compendium of recipes, sketches, photographs, essays, spells, and instructions that ask us to engage with the climate emergency in new and imaginative ways in our daily lives, in our homes and communities, parks and public spaces. The contributors of the book invite you to scribble on these pages, to rip them out and take them to a protest, letting the book become a companion in thinking together about new futures. And I'm bringing here some of, uh, some of the contributions uh, within the book and focusing also in um, interspecies relationships. So here you have Alexandra uh, Daisy Ginsburg's contribution, find the piece of ground, garden of, or pavement, woodland, field, or jungle. Measure out one square meter, a quadrat with string or tape. Kneel down, list all of the living things you can see in the square. Imagine the organisms you can't see. Think about the interrelationships between all these beings. Give them all names. Make up your own if you don't know theirs. Now step inside the square. Think about your relationships with every being in the square with you. Do you feel big or small? Repeat on a different terrain. Asad Raza uh, uh, compels us to choose a being to take care of, to help them thrive according to their own principle of growth. And this is James Bridal contribution to the book, which is part of our uh, of a larger project um, that we are developing together for Back to Earth and will appear in the next few months and is also the, um, the core inspiration for his new book that is coming out very soon with Penguin called Ways of Being. Um, so for James Bridal there and throughout their research, uh, the ranges of plants and animals are moving in response to recent changes in climate. As temperatures rise, ecosystems with nowhere to go, such as mountains, are considered more threatened. However, species survival may depend as much on keeping peace, on keeping pace with moving climate, climates as the climate's ultimate resistance. According to researchers at the University of California, the global mean velocity of climate change is 0.42 kilometers per year, or about 1.15 meters per day. This is the distance plants and animals, including us, need to physically move forwards or uphill every day for our immediate environment to stay exactly the same. This velocity will continue to increase. So James proposes to find a plant, ask its permission and pay attention to the answer. If it is agreeable, move it 1.15 meters towards the nearest pole, the south or the north. Or if you like, walk further with it. 420 meters for a year, 4.2 kilometers for a decade, 42 kilometers for a century. If you don't want to disturb the plant, take a seed or a cutting. Repeat as many times as possible with as many plants as you can carry. And for another type of garden, which will be the last thing that I leave you with is Professor Sokoyaman's uh, instruction to create a garden. Um, write down your fears on a piece of white, on a white square piece of rice paper, fold the paper into a tiny triangle, set on fire, take the ass outside, put it in dirt, plant a flower in the dirt, pansies, cosmos, snapdragons, and repeat until you have a garden. So I'll leave it here and open to discussion. Um, and I can talk more again about uh, specific projects. So over to you, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much for this presentation. It's really interesting to see how uh, uh, complex programming. And I, I bet uh, the, but I take it for granted that the uh, Serpentine Gallery has a, a, a quite extensive reach to the wide public. I was about to ask, what is the ultimate um, purpose of uh, making projects like this? What, uh, yeah, question number one. 
the um, the ultimate purpose is that you know a lot of uh, public art institutions, especially through uh, the last um, two or, or so years, have been going through existential crisis, as I would say. Um, there are a lot of issues that have become intensively um, traveling both for the wider world, but both self-reflexively for institutions and to what their, all, their role is in society. Um, there is one thing at the Serpentine that makes it special or different, at least from other institutions, is that we don't have um, a collection. So we don't have a responsibility to preserving and uh, showcasing a collection, which in many cases is, of course, tied to questions of nationhood and in many, many cases to colonization and um, other issues that are at the forefront of um, cultural discourse right now. So the fact that we don't have a collection gives us a lot of liberty to work within um, uh, our spaces, whether it is an exhibition space or other spaces that we create ourselves via the live programs that we do that um, travel around London and the world to forefront um, issues that are, you know, important for our society. And of course, for the last few years, um, we decided to focus on the environment and the climate emergency, but definitely throughout our daily life experience, but also uh, through um, keeping up with the discourse and its development in our in-depth research into um, climate justice, there are issues that are civic issues, human rights issues that pertain to the environmental effort, and these are tied together and should not be thought of as separate. So the main purpose for us and the main goal is to really immerse ourselves in all of the complexity that um, makes up for um, what we can do as individuals, as a society, as uh, collectives uh, in the face of the climate emergency. And that is a lesson that we need to learn as an institution that it takes time. So we don't want to engage with these topics in a way that is quite standard or has been quite standard in the past. Say, for example, okay, we have an exhibition in 2022. We invite these artists and we're like, we want you to do this, please join this exhibition. And then once the exhibition is open and uh, closed, then we drop the subject and move to something else. That is not the way to engage with something like this. So this is a learning and goal for us as an institution on how a specific project like this can teach us how to be better and how to be um, more connected and more purposeful within society. And uh, I think this problematic of environmental crisis will not really cease uh, anytime soon. If this were, uh, if this engagement and this kind of, uh, I'd say, artistic practice or organ art organizing practice uh, was to continue, what would be the outcome in the long term? Like in the arts, would how 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 do you imagine the art would uh, be uh, in, say, um, twenty years? From now on in this, under this, um, let's say. Well, I, I, would like to, I would like to think that um, it will be a quite or, organic um, and purposeful change, like with the one that we are trying to do back to earth because also of the way that we have um, approached it, really tries to weave in and out out of, every um, every possible output that we have as an art institution. It's not just an exhibition, it's a live program, it's publications, it's uh, digital commissions, it's education and civic projects. So that goes to show that we are in it for the long haul. We, it's a long-term project. It's, um, it's a dedication and commitment that we've made as Serpentine to continue working with the artists um, that we have already approached and more that we are 
um, hoping that it will join us in the coming years. And by making that commitment as an art institution, you will naturally see, as we have seen in the last two and a half years that we have been working this, that more connections are made, more um, important and uh, things that are in development projects are supported, those create um, new kind of synapses, new kind of ideas and new kind of connections that lead to new things. And that becomes, that becomes an organic process of how to work both as curators, um, as, um, as educators, um, thinking about my colleagues in education and as people within an art institution that has taken this pledge to work um, with dedication and commitment on environmental justice for the long term, you will see, and we hope that we'll make that very public, that we will learn as we go along and what we learned, not just our successes, but also our failures will be served. Um, the Back to Earth exhibition will feature very prominently within the institution as a case study of sustainability as well, because that is also something that a lot of art institutions need to urgently address. Everyone has their own uh, part to play and um, uh, sustainability discourse and practice. So we will learn on how to create exhibitions and the future that have um, hopefully at some point net zero effects on what we're trying uh, to put forward as an, uh, as an art institution. So we will be recycling all of the exhibition walls from the previous exhibition and we'll be um, sourcing, of course, local materials, materials and find new and innovative ways to print exhibition catalogs and uh, work together with artists to make projects that um, leave back no harm. So you think this uh, huge, I think we are witnessing also during the corona, this kind of uh, collapse of the commercial market in a way. So this might also be a contribution to this uh, change of the whole kind of uh, discourse. I mean, not discourse, but the whole kind of um, env um, vibe or atmosphere in the arts, right? I mean, um, just using the packaging materials selling so sending the, the art pieces artworks mm -hmm. that's where it's engaging such a waste of plastic and, and right unrecycled mess uh, of things and i think even the practices of the artists would change right in the long term very much so in in, produ in production and um, absolutely creating. and um just to mention that there is an important uh initiative called the gallery climate coalition the gcc that is um that was founded in London, but it's uh, very international, that is looking specifically at the commercial art sector and commercial galleries and art firms um, have embedded on a journey of really rethinking what those, um, you know, what those working practices are um, and how they can be reimagined uh, with a huge sense of urgency for the future. If you think about how many art fairs are happening around the world at every single time and um, how, again, the pandemic really caused us to stop and pause and reflect for a moment and um, not just, you know, about the possibility of um, coming together at a time where, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of um, cases around the world and people will uh, continue to be infected with the virus, but also what it means uh, practically to, to have these gatherings in terms of the the blue the, the 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 green print for the planet so if you go into the calorie climate coalition website you will see that they have for example a carbon calculator that can be used by each institution and gallery for um for their own sustainability credentials and you will see that for example the the common, the most common answer for what it is that an art institution or a gallery is most responsible for in terms of um, carbon emissions is travel. And travel, of course, relates to the pandemic, as we know. So this is a moment in time when um, the effects of the global pandemic have 
have caused us to stop and think about how many of the things that we're discussing in the environmental effort are actually interrelated. A virus is not separate from carbon emissions and people congregating and creating additional waste. Question from a colleague of mine. Hello, Costas. Here, here is Indra. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, so, um, Thank you very much for the talk and for, for all the effort. I mean, like the project is very impressive. I mean, uh, so much uh, so much effort. And I wanted to ask if you if you made some uh, analysis of the impact that actually all this all this made. If if there were uh, so so my question points to the to the fact that maybe uh, that's what I'm trying to think about critically is what is actually uh, the influence of of the uh, of the art and and the performance that and all the all the effort that we are trying to make uh, either scientists or or uh, or artists that uh, that is put into the presentation of, of the results or or all, all the feelings of all these kind of things but is there uh, was there any uh, type of analysis made what uh, if if after such a huge effort uh, the the thinking of some people change or uh, have you made some kind of uh, like feedback did you get some feedback from from the people uh, from the common uh, public uh, after year or uh, years of, of your project uh thank you that's a very good question and it's something that is um very much in our minds we had some opportunities that were quite important as lessons um in the past but because of the the beginning of the project being in 2020 when when you know we were not able to gather together the exhibition was Plan for 2020, then it was moved to 2021, and now it's the summer in 2022. Finally, um, we haven't had that moment of um, staging a way or finding a way to gather all of this quantitative and qualitative responses to the project. And we hope that this summer, with the exhibition open at the Serpentine, that will be our moment. But what I have to say is that what is an important lesson for us and what um, I have cherished as a live programs curator is uh, throughout the course of the project um, and before the pandemic we've done you know um, live and public programs that talk about um, the intersection of art and ecology and the climate emergency and this was um, this was a way to understand again and finesse better and clarify the importance of bringing together art with things that is not usually brought together in our minds. So why uh, bring together um, artists and scientists? Because when we do a live program event, and that was my lesson from it is that you get a completely new audience it was it wasn't people that would come to us as they usually would because we are the serpentine and it is a well-known art institution and we're doing an arts program we got people that heard about our program somewhere because they are interested in soil for example soil was the focus of one of our um big uh general ecology symposia that was live streamed um in the middle of 2020 and we got about 7,000 people joining around the world. And those audiences um, were not audiences that were directly related to art. And people um, who attended really uh, understood that, you know, they come to this because they're in, interested in um, the, how to help in the, in the climate emergency. And one of the ways that I haven't thought about was through engaging with art and the work of artists and creative practitioners. So that is an important lesson that we have uh, learned. And that is something that we also want to address um, as we go into the summer, because, you know, the exhibition being open at the Serpentine, a lot of people will hear that, oh, you know, there is an exhibition about the climate emergency and will come that would usually not come to an art institution. So that is something that is really important to us and we really want to engage with it more and learn and share our learnings with everyone else. 
Thank you very much. Well, uh, that's, that's a good idea to take the science out of the institution to the public and, and use the let's say, power of art to present uh, the results. Uh, uh, I, I would like to ask if there are some questions from the public. If not, I have another one. Uh, well, well, one of the concerns uh, could be that uh, by presenting or talking about things and problems is that we are making them basically abstract. And, 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 and we are in the places where the problems uh, may not be seen. And then uh, people after, after, for example, uh, working with the spider, they, they may think, okay, I have learned something and I, I have done enough. But uh, the actual impact on, on the change uh, is maybe uh, very, very low. Well, that, that would be uh, the concern. Maybe it's not true. What, what is your opinion on this? Like, if we are by, by just presenting the things and, and talking about them is not uh, actually making things worse, uh, it, 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 even if it, it, it may sound strange, but uh, actually then the people may think, okay, I've been informed, I know this, and then they live their own own lives and, and, and just having this uh, satisfaction by learning things and, and not actually doing. I, I think that's uh, the, the problem of, it may be one of the problems that uh, one should also, or, or the question to ask if, if, if it is not like this, if we are not making the problems that abstract, uh, that the satisfaction from the doing abstract things is actually it, and the people will, uh, will not continue to uh, pers pursue the, the change which is needed, for example. I, it's a good question, and I think it's a, uh, it's a conundrum that keeps coming back, um, whether it is the discourse and effort of uh, environmental and climate justice, or whether it is civil rights and uh, um, the uprisings that we have seen um, in the last few years, or whether currently with the situation and of the world and war, yes, there's always that um, discussion that is coming. But I think that there is no alternative, really. What would you do not? Sir, um, knowledge and resources. We are always uh, in favor of sharing our knowledge, our ideas and resources because the alternative is silence. So uh, even if for some people they might engage with it on a very small scale, they know that that idea or toolkit or group or project is available and out there in the world so you know maybe tomorrow they will engage one minute with it but maybe further down the line something else will happen in their lives or in their thinking and will remind them of that thing that they engaged with even if it wasn't for a significant and dedicated amount of time that that connection can be made to it so um i really do argue for the continuation of dialogue, of exchange of ideas, as abstract as they can be. They can be from highly theoretical to practical. And um, by continuing to talk to each other, that is the only way that we're going to hopefully work together in a meaningful way for whatever it is that we dedicate ourselves individually and collectively to. Um, and I chose also those examples specifically with um, Tomas Saraceno and the spiders. Like, if you do take a picture in order to access the new or the third version of the augmented reality spider, you need to take a picture of an actual spider. And that um, application and project and Tomas are actually creating a living archive around the world just by people participating um, in this art project of spiders and their locations and their webs. So that archive traces the, the effect of, you know, different geographies and cartographies and um, uh, climate changes around the world on this species. And of course, um, I mentioned briefly there for every action, there is a financial contribution that um, the, the project makes to uh, support biodiversity around the world. 
places garden, um, yes, it can be a public garden at Eden or in Hyde Park um, at the Serpentine, but she has open sourced the methodology for you to create a, a garden everywhere that you are in the world. So pollinator gardens, hopefully, again, through art, will start appearing um, by individual actions of people that have come across the project um, around the world. They might be small, but they're there. And the alternative is nothing. So I say, let's keep doing this. Let's keep uh, sharing um, projects and in, engage people and incremental ways. Um, you can't expect people to, you know, come across something. And I mean, hopefully they will come across something and dedicate themselves to wholeheartedly. But any kind of sharing is critical at this moment in time. As, I, as you were saying this, I was just uh, trying to add this, uh, I'm just last one comment, is that uh, I think the reality itself in the arts is such that uh, there are not so many artists actually uh, working in this field yet. And I think this is also a way of convincing the other people in the arts to work in this direction and not just to, you know, pursue their kind of consumer, uh, romantic, whatever it is, uh, trajectory, but to, to, to shift towards this... Uh, sustainable the way of thinking of the future actually is it, is it counts no? I, th I think you know I, I mean like you really have to search for people who work in this field or convince them to maybe I see increasingly people um, working uh, with this issues and um, as I tried also to touch upon in the presentation it's not just about trying to find artists and practitioners that work aesthetically or thematically with the topic of ecology and environmentalism. It's about also trying to reach people who have these concerns as a way of thinking, of being, and of working within their practices. And you will also see that these people will, um, there will be more and more people like this as the years uh, go ahead, just because out of uh, the sense of urgency and necessity that we have to really address the way that um, we save our lives and our labor in response to um, the climate change. Uh, so you will see more and more people. And I think that we it will be useful to um, kind of like step out of um, the cliche, if you think, uh, if, if you may, to think about art that has an importance um, in the in the in the in the environmental dialogue should be, you know, um, prescriptive or figurative of green issues. It doesn't have to be just about you know um, gardens or other species. It can be a, about ecological ways of thinking and working together and uh, taking action together as a practice of being and living. Also, maybe just the way, not doesn't have to be necessarily this, this theme, but even just the way how they produce works and how they think about the production of the works themselves. That might change. Absolutely, but, yes. Well, I think, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. It's very inspiring and um, Looking forward to see you in Prague physically, hopefully very soon. Fingers crossed. Thank you so much for the invitation. This has been great and uh, I look forward to the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.